All right, James. It's toward the back of your Bible. Right, I believe it's right after the book of Hebrews. Let's see, yep. Right after the book of Hebrews. I believe it's right before the book of Jude, too. I'm not sure. Let me look. Right before Peter. All right, yeah, right before Peter. Right after Hebrews. James, chapter number one. Whoa. Get on some stuff here in just a moment. If everybody found the place, all right. We'll go ahead and just dive right off in it here tonight. I was wrestling uh, this week with what to come, you know, what book. Everybody's come up and said, well, where are we going to go to? And I, I really tell you the truth, I didn't have a clue until just a little bit ago. I was, uh, in my spirit, I felt the book of James just tremendously. Brother Bill, you know how you feel something, how the Lord just puts it on your heart and lays it on your heart. And, uh. I was wrestling between Hebrews and James, so maybe after James we may go to Hebrews unless the Lord leads another way. But James is uh, five chapters, so it may not take long, but James is a very, very powerful book, and it's a, a different kind of book than what we're used to in the New Testament. And I'll tell you something. I just told Brother David Atkins, and I learned this just a while ago, that actually the book of James is the oldest book in the New Testament. It was actually written first before any other book in the New Testament was written. James was written and uh, actually at an earlier date than any other book, including the gospel. So uh, it was written around 40 to 50 A.D., not long after Jesus had died and had resurrected and all. It was not long after that James wrote this. And I'm going to tell you another fun fact. James here is actually the author of James is the half-brother to Jesus Christ. Now, this is, this is awesome right here. Let me read the first verse. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. And, and when it first calls James' name right here, uh, in the Bible, there's a bunch, especially in the New Testament, there is four different Jameses that the Bible speaks of. Number one, uh, James... Uh, back in the Gospels, he was talked about a lot. James, the brother of John. Y'all remember them? The sons of Zebedee, the sons of Thunder, they called them. And every time Jesus would go in to heal somebody, it was always Peter, James, and John. And James and John, that's... And James, I believe he was called, uh, well, the sons of Thunder, the sons of Zebedee. But this wouldn't be him. It wouldn't be his book because he... When this was written, he had already died. You remember in the book of Acts chapter 12, uh, they were suffering, the church was suffering persecution, and they killed James, and then they went after Peter. If y'all remember back in the book of Acts. So James, that James was dead at this time. There was another James in the Gospels that uh, Jesus spoke of. It was James, he was called James the Lesser. And I don't believe it was because uh, he was any lower than anybody else, but I believe it was probably because he was, he might have been smaller than somebody else. Maybe been a short guy, who knows, but he was called James the Lesser, uh, but this don't line up with any of his uh, writings or documents. And then there was another guy, and I'm going to try to hurry through this. There was another guy named James. He was called, in the Bible, he was called James the father of Judas. And it's not Judas is scary. As a matter of fact, when they talk about him, they say James the father of Judas, not Iscariot. <laughs> so anyways, then there was this guy, James. He was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. And uh, think about this with me just for a moment. We always talk about uh, Mother Mary being a virgin, and she was when Jesus was born. But later on in life, after Jesus was born, we find out that Mother Mary and Joseph, that they had children of their own. The Bible actually makes mention and calls all the sons by name, but they had sisters. Jesus had sisters as well. But what, how, how do you think it would be to have an elder brother who was perfect? Think about this now. How, how do you think it would be to have an older brother that was just perfect? When your parents go to Holland, well, which one of y'all boys made this mess? Well, surely it wasn't Jesus. We know that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Which one of y'all, why didn't y'all take out the trash? Well, if Jesus would have been here, I know he would have done it, you know. Think about it. He was always perfect. Jesus, but him being your half-brother, that would be kind of hard, living up to his standards, you know. 
But the James here, we find out that if you read in the book of John, chapter 7, verse number 5, the Bible said that all of Jesus' brothers did not believe in him. That's harsh, ain't it? John chapter 7, verse 5 will tell you that. Jesus' brothers did not believe in him. And later we find out that Jesus was doing miracles and they still didn't believe in him. And finally, if you get to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 7, the Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross, he resurrected and he was seen by many. Finally, he showed up to his brother where finally his brother finally started believing. Whenever he seen that Jesus had died and resurrected, he said, well, I guess you are the Lord. I guess you are this, my Savior or, or the Lord and you are sent from God. And he finally started believing and when he saw that brother Tim Bailey, he began to live for God like nobody else. I'm talking about he went into overdrive. Before he was kind of like a lot of church people are today, he just was there. He was with Jesus, but he didn't really believe wholeheartedly. Y'all know what I'm talking about? He, he was there, he was close to the action, but he just was this okay. If he is, he is. If he ain't, he ain't. You know, I'm afraid that's the way a lot of people are in the church world today. They're just here, but if God is God, he is. If he ain't, he ain't. But listen, church, we should never have any doubt in our mind. James is going to talk about it here in a minute. There should never be any doubt in your mind that if he is or if he ain't. We know he is. He is the Son of God. We'll get more on it in just a minute. But the theme of James, before we get started, I'm trying to go over the book here. The theme of James, the whole way through, is talking about growing up. I remember back when we was kids, that's what people used to tell me, grow up. I'm like, I am. That's every day I'm growing up, you know. You, you kind of can't help it. You grow up. Growing yeah, growing, huh? Growing, growing out. out. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Eating like this, we really grow it, ain't we? Oh, goodness. But but listen, think about this with this moment before we get started. When a baby is born, you know, when a baby is first born in a hospital and that baby comes out, most of the time you look at it and you're like, well, I don't know really who it looks like, if it looks like the mom or the daddy. But after a little while, a point in time, a certain measurement of time, you start saying, hey, they begin to take characteristics of somebody in their family and they say, hey, now they look like their dad. Or now they look like their mom. And then they get a little bit older and you say, hey, now they're acting like them. I know mine, they look like me, but they act like their mama. <laughs> yes, I know. Bless our hearts. <laughs> you got triplets, she said. Yeah, Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Anyways, a baby, as they grow, they begin to take on characteristics and they begin to take on traits. They begin to grow and they begin to take that on from their family. And I want to tell you this much. Uh, as a child of God, we do the same thing. When we first start out, you know what? People may look at you and say, well, yeah, I can see a change. But the longer you are a child of God, you want to start taking on characteristics and begin to look like your Father in heaven. Right. Amen. Amen. As we grow and we mature, and see, that's the thing. And as a child, Brother Mike, when a baby, when they're, when they're first learning to talk and walk and all that, oh, they they just so cute. And, and, you know, they can say anything. They can, in every word they say, Brother Steve, you, they said my name. Did you hear that? It could be right or right. And you'd be like, oh, that's just so beautiful. They said my name. You know, and you don't even know what they said. But yeah, sometimes they do. But you know when they when they say dad, dad, and you're like, mark that down, write that down, write the time down, write all this stuff down. We're going to keep this in our in our journal here. That way we can know what day they said dad, dad, or mama on and all this. But think about this: when that kid now is five year old, ten year old, or twenty five year old, and they say dad, dad, it ain't cute no more. Right? It ain't cute no more. You're not the little baby that you used to be. Now we expect maturity out of you. Amen. Some parents might not, but if you're five-year-old, you don't need to be going around saying, Dad, Dad, sucking your thumb no more. If you're 10-year-old, you sure don't. If you're 25-year-old, I know some 25-year-olds that still act like that. But you don't, you need to mature. And it's the same way with our walk with God. When we get saved, we may be walking around saying, Dad, Dad. But when you have been in this for a while, 
Somebody needs to get a hold of this. When we've been in this for a little while, Brother Bill, we don't need to be walking around hollering, Dad, Dad, wanting bottle. We need to be saying hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, walking in the Lord and talking with the Lord. And, and, and we need to grow up and mature and become complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. We should not be babes in the Lord anymore. Most of us in here, we, we've, we've been in church for a while now and, and, and we ought to be growing every day. If we are in the same place we were when we got saved, we're actually backing up because God said every day we should grow. Every day we should get to the next level. And that's what kind of the book of James is all about. James, if it's like any other book in the Bible, it's kind of like Proverbs. It's kind of in your face and it'll talk on one subject and then it might, the next verse might jump to a whole other subject and then come right back to it. It's all over the place, but it's very good and very powerful. Go ahead, Brother Bill. Get off the milk and get on the meat. Get off the milk and get on the meat. That's right. Amen. That's it. That's it. A lot of people want to stay on the milk because it's more comfortable. They don't want to. They don't want to grow, and, and they don't want to because they were like I used to be. Well, the more I know, the more I'm going to be responsible for. I used to think that way, and I've told you all this before. Sonia and I, we said, we're not studying that Bible because I know if I learn it, then i got to live it, and I wasn't ready to yet. But there comes a day where you got to grow up. Boy, Amen. Right. man, there comes a day we got to grow up and we got to take the diapers off and we got to get the bottle out of our mouth and we got to grow up and live for the Lord and act like we're adults Amen. in Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, then that's what the book of James is all about. So that gives us a good introduction. James chapter 1 verse 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I read that right there, I'm thinking, my goodness gracious, how humble James is. Because if I'm the Lord's brother, Brother Bill, and I wrote this book, you know what it would say? Chad, a brother of the Lord Jesus Christ who was perfectly awesome and a servant of Jesus. But he didn't do that, did he? He just said, I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That tells me something. Jesus was more than James's brother. He was his Lord. You see, there's something more important than, than being a brother to Jesus is him being your Lord. Y'all quiet. Y'all bad quiet now. Y'all gonna have to wake up now. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. They wouldn't scattered by abroad, but they were scattered abroad. Some of y'all got that. Trying to wake y'all up. The twelve tribes, if you'll remember in the book of Acts, the Bible said that they were suffering persecution and, and that they killed James, I told you a moment ago, and they were kill, fishing to kill Peter. They locked him up, put him in jail, and, and they began to this rain down havoc on the church. And therefore, the people of Israel, they began to scatter and disperse all over the world. They began to go different places because they were not safe in Jerusalem anymore. I've told y'all before, when the children of Israel, the, the Christians, when they would walk out in the streets, their brothers would be hanging on the sides of buildings, burning with fire for them being a child of God. And we think we got it rough. They would burn on the walls. They would kill them for having the, uh, uh, the word of God in their mouth and, and being uh, testifying that they're a child of God, brother mine. They would lock them in jail. They would torture them. Listen, James right here. James, if you read much in history, Josephus was a historian. And Josephus said that James was a mighty man of prayer so much that when you saw him, his knees were so callous and they were swelled up so much that it looked like a camel's knees. This is history. You know what? That man believed in prayer. That man believed on falling on his knees. What happened to that in the church today? Where we get on our knees and we get calluses on our knees. And listen now. We don't even want to talk to God standing up. Well, the Lord getting on our knees. Lord, if I get down, I can't get up. Man, that's the attitude now. 
Man, you've got to have padded pews and air conditioner and you've got to have good music to hype you up and you've got to have all this stuff before you can even get in the mood to talk to God. Listen, you need to get down to business with God whether you ain't got a song playing or whether it's somebody you're pushing you to. You need to learn to talk to God anytime, day or night. Whether you're going good or going bad, you need to learn to get on your knees and begin to pray and cry out to God. Get down to business with Him. Find you a war room to get in. And go to battle with the devil. Amen. I'm telling you, you and I are here and saved because somebody believed in the power of prayer and they prayed for you just like they prayed for me. Hallelujah. Where is the saints of God that will get down to business with the Lord and fight the devil and pray heaven down and cast hell out? Where is those saints of God at? James, he would pray and he got on his knees and he had calluses on his knees and he believed in his Lord. He might not have believed in him at first, but when he seen Jesus rose from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15 and 7, it says that Jesus appeared to him and from that time forward, he began to live for God. I'm talking about with everything that he had. James was martyred for Jesus, Brother Mike. And history says that James, now I want y'all to understand and listen to this because it's powerful. James was took up on the highest part of the temple and they shoved him off of the highest point on the temple. But the fall, when he landed, it didn't kill him. This is all written in history. When he landed, it didn't kill him. But all of the accusers come up and begin to kick him and begin to hit him and begin to take stones and stone him. The whole time they said while he was dying, he was praying for his attackers. While he was dying for Jesus, while he was dying because he was a child of God, he was praying for the ones that were killing him right then and right there. Man, we can't even pray for somebody because they look at us the wrong way. And Jesus said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. James, the servant of God, this is men and women in the early church. This is what the church is supposed to look like. Somebody that has a backbone and will pray and will stand for Jesus all the way to your grave. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. I told you this was the earliest book that was written in the New Testament. I know it's toward the end. It's not in order. It's not written in how what the date was. It's just however they allowed King James to put this in the Bible, in order here. It's not in a certain numerical or yearly date or whatever you call that. Chronological, chronological that's right. It's not in a chronological order or anything like that. But James, since it was the earliest book in the New Testament, this was kind of before a lot of Gentiles were coming and being saved. Because you got to understand, Jesus first come for the house of Israel. He said that in the book of Matthew. He said, I come for the lost tribes of Israel. I come to the house of Israel. And then when Israel would not accept Jesus, he said, I'm turning. I'm going somewhere else. I've got sheep, other sheep that you know not of. And that's when he come to the Gentiles. He come to us. And, and thank God that we accepted him as our Lord and our Savior. And he brought us into the sheepfold. But this book was written before there was a lot of Gentiles that were getting saved. So James is writing to the tribes of Israel. That's why it says that right there. To the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. Greetings. And that's kind of the way we write any letter nowadays. We always start out, hey, greetings. That's, that's what it... The Apostle Paul was backwards. He didn't. He saved the hey part to the end. And he started out, Paul, he wrote his name at the beginning. You know, we always write our name at the end. Paul did it backwards. But James, he started out, hey. And he said who he was. Sure. Yes, sir. The people this day and time, they get saved. They think that's all they are to. Oh, that's right. But Absolutely. Not, there's a whole lot more. There's a whole I lot remember more. remember this time when they had that old book of our prayer cancer. Yes, sir. Some of us all over the floor. Yes, sir. Hot, oh, it's right. hot. And they would have church. That's they it. They would get down on their knees like you're talking about. Oh, that's it, bro. And they'd get to pray. Yes. And the Holy Ghost would get to move. Absolutely. The people would get saved. That's right. That's right. And that's where the church is. Come from. Yes. Absolutely. They need to go back to the 
That's it. Did they serve then? Absolutely. And start serving the Lord like it Yes, did. yes. That's it, brother. I agree wholeheartedly. I agree wholeheartedly. Listen, we have got, let me say this the easiest way I know how. We have got spoiled. Yeah. We've got spoiled. Look, we got a nice <laughs> facility. We got air conditioning. We got padded pews up here. We got nice chairs down here. I mean, we're, we're spoiled. That ought to make you want to serve the Lord that much more. Them folks used to have pews that when you sat down on them, they would pinch your behind. And if somebody got up, it's going to pinch your behind. I'm talking about squeak. It was hot. They had to raise the windows or either they had church outside with the sawdust floors. And I'm telling you, those folks getting saved left and right, Holy Ghost falling around on everybody in sight. I mean, these folks had church. Why? Because they had a heart of prayer and a heart of worship and they were not afraid to show it. Amen. Now we come to church and we got it made and we won't even stand up for Jesus. Breast Harbor, yeah. We yeah. said on logs. Right. That's it. Absolutely. Set on logs. And then, I mean, they had church. Listen, in this day, they had church. Most of the time, they would have church down by a, a body of water. Most of the time, it was by the river or it was by a creek somewhere. Wherever they had water, usually that's where they were going to have church at because every time they had church, they had people getting saved and wanting to get baptized. So therefore, they would have their church by a body of water that any time somebody would get saved, they'd say, come on, let's go down and get baptized now. I'm, how, I'm telling you, where did that time go to? And I tell you, God has never changed, so it's the people. That's right. And it's our mindset. You see, people now don't even seek for the Holy Ghost. Right, right. You don't ever see anyone in the seeking for the Holy Ghost. That's it. That's the it. The Holy Ghost is not that hard. That's right. It's a gift. Sherry. Yes, yes. And it's a gift from God. Absolutely. All you got to do is get yourself ready to receive. That's it. Absolutely. And most people, they won't even come up to the altar to pray to get the Holy That's God. right. That's it, brother. That's right. We ought to be lined up from front to back. We ought to be lined up. I tell you, people, I go stand in Walmart lines a mile long, but at the prayer line, nobody wants to come up. I know this ain't popular preaching, but I'm telling you the truth tonight. We'll stand in line for hours to get something we want, but when the Holy Ghost is ready to move upon you, nobody wants to move. The bladder goes to acting up. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. The bladder goes to acting up. Or, whoops, I got a phone call. Or, oops, I left the turkey on. I got to go. It's always an excuse when it comes to God. But we got time. That, that's priorities are not in the right place. It's hard preaching sometimes, but it, it's true. It's true. We got to get down to business with God. If we knew how close God was to coming back right now, I believe everybody, every altar service would be in the altars. I don't claim to know when Jesus is coming back. The Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour. But he said you will know the signs and the seasons. And we can see it plain as day the way we are headed right now. Jesus, it ain't gonna be long. Yeah. It ain't gonna be long. Yes, you can feel it in your spirit. And God has been pouring out dream after dream after dream after dream. Pull up YouTube and just type in the second coming or the rapture. Type it in and see you'll see thousands, not a few, but thousands of people who are having dream after dream every night. Every night having dreams. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. People, this is not people just making this up. They're bawling their eyes out because they say people don't realize how soon Jesus is going to be here. And some of the dreams are so similar, and these people don't notice. They, they, they're on the other side of the world, too, Sister Monica. Now, this is people not just in America, but in England and Britain and France and, and, and all over the world. People are having dreams. That's God pouring out his spirit. Joel chapter 3, Acts chapter 2, In the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will have visions. Your young men will dream dreams. Or your young men will have visions and your old men will dream dreams upon my handmaidens and my servants. 
they will prophesy. Listen. You better make sure your lamps are full. That's right. Be sure our lamps is full. That's it. And that's what I mean. We ought to, every time the, the altars are open, we ought to be there seeking God. Amen. And let me move on and get down to this next one here. Verse number two. He said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or into various trials is what that actually means in the Greek. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, diverse temptations, different kinds of temptations, different kinds of trials is what that's talking about, Brother Mike. You know, most of the time when we fall into a trial or a temptation or something that's going on in our life, we usually don't count it joy, do we? We usually don't say, oh, bless God, here's another temptation. Well, thank you, Jesus. Here's another trial i got to go through. If you do, boy, I'm going to give you a pat on the back. <laughs> because the Bible says we're to count it joy. Now let me tell you something real quick and we'll move on. Temptations does not come from God. Trials come from God. Temptations come from the devil. You'll see that bared out in the book of James here in just a moment. God does not tempt you with nothing. But God gives you trials that we go through to test your faith and to produce patience. And this, by the word patience here in James, we're about to see it. It's not actually patience as in waiting at the doctor's office, waiting. It's actually patience talking about endurance, holding on, being able to press on. Growing, faith. Growing in the faith. That's right. We'll hit on it. But he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials or diverse temptations, knowing that the trying or the testing of your faith produces patience. And that word right there, patience, I just told you it actually means endurance, that you can keep going. If you break it down in the Greek, it means to stay under. And what it's referring to is somebody that has a heavy load upon them, but they're not looking for a way to escape, but they're looking for a way to press home to the other side. That's the word right here, that when you fall into trials, you're not trying to escape out of it, but you're trying to grow through it, and you're going to keep pressing because there is a reward at the end of every trial. Amen. We'll see that here in a moment. Let me get on down. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith produces patience. But let patience or endurance have its perfect word that you may be perfect. And that word perfect there does not mean that you are going to be a perfect Christian. Amen. Amen. Because there ain't a one of you in here, and I sure ain't perfect. Never will be. Never will be. Until the Lord comes back again and we get our spiritual bodies, we're all fallen sinners saved by grace. Woo. Man alive, that ought to make somebody shout. I'm happy that I'm saved. I'm thankful that God saved me when I didn't realize that I didn't, I didn't deserve it, Brother Steve. I did not deserve God's grace, but he reached down and did it anyways. Thank you, Lord. And it says... But let patience have its perfect word that you may be perfect. That word perfect means mature. It means that we're going to grow in the Lord. Hallelujah. That we're be made mature and complete, lacking nothing. How many knows in here tonight, and I pray every one of you do, how many knows in here tonight that God don't want his children lacking anything? If you need something from God, you need to come to the altar and ask Him for it. Because my God wants to supply all of your needs, but He's not going to give it to you if you sit back and don't ask Him for it. But if you ask God, you'll find out in the next verse, if you ask God, He gives liberally, which means generously. Let me just get on down here, David. Amen. Don't take my word for it, but listen to what God's Word says. He said that I don't want you to lack anything. I want you to be perfect and complete or mature to grow and to be complete lacking nothing. Verse number five, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally, that means generously, 
who gives to all generously and without reproach. I believe the King James says, who upbraideth not. That means without reproach. That means God is not going to get mad at you because you ask for something. A lot of people say, I'm not going to bug God about something. God does not ever, and let me repeat that, He does not ever get mad at somebody for seeking something from Him. You can go to God 150 times an hour and He still will not reproach you or upbraid you. He will welcome you with open arms and will pour out to you everything that you are in need of. People say, well, I don't want to bug God. Listen, you're not hurting God, I promise you. What hurts God is when you sit back and don't talk to Him. What hurts God is when you say, I'm not taking that to Him. God longs to hear from every one of us. And God longs to pour out of Himself into every one of you. Every one of us. If you want a gift from God, then seek Him for it. If you want a gift from God, all you got to do is say, just like Isaiah, here I am, Lord, right here. Right here, God, right here. Draw a circle. I'm right here, God, right here. I'm looking for it, God. I'm seeking for it. I want wisdom. I want the Holy Ghost. I want discerning the spirits. I want the gifts of God. I'll pour them out, Lord. Listen, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, listen, because when we're going through a trial... When we're going through a temptation or something of that nature, we need wisdom to make a godly decision, right? To understand what you're going through and to understand what move you need to make. Because when you're going through a trial, and when I say trial, I'm talking about a hard time in your life or, or an uncertain time in your life, something that's going on in your life that you don't understand when you're going through that time, you need wisdom more than ever. Because it's at those moments when the enemy likes to come in and tries to make you not use your head and do the wrong thing. Amen. But if we have godly wisdom, we can do what God wants us to do. Because the Bible said that the Holy Spirit comes to lead you and guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead you in a ditch, Brother David. The Holy Spirit is going to lead you in the right path. But the Bible says the blind lead the blind. If you don't ask God, guess what? You're going at your situation blinded. And you're going to end up in a ditch. All right, let's go down here. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously or liberally and without reproach, and what it will be given to him. I'm going to say that one more time. And it will be given to him. That ought to make you shout right there. I'm talking about if you ask God, it will be given to you. Amen. Amen. If you don't want nothing, that's fine. But I do. I do. I want everything that God says we can have. I want to be everything God says we can be. Amen. I want all the gifts of God that he wants to pour out. Amen. Not so I can glory in myself, but so that I can work and be a messenger of the Lord. We're not asking this so we can be a, a super saint. We're not seeking for the Holy Ghost so we can look who. Cool. Because I guarantee you, if you're fully walking in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you're not going to look who. Cool. People's going to think you look crazy. People's going to laugh at you. But you know what? God's going to smile at you. God's going to say, that's my child. That's my child. Hallelujah. I know. Praise the Lord. I know my child. And I'm proud. Just because you don't get it the first time, Chad, mm -hmm. that don't mean you don't need to go back. That's, that's it. Right. That's it. Absolutely. We'll go back. I've known people, Brother Bill, who has prayed for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And some I've known who has come the first time and received it right then. Yeah. But then I've known others who has come and prayed for the gifts of the Holy Spirit and it's took time. Not ready for it. That's it. That's it. God has a time for every one of us and He has a place that He needs you to use that gift. And when it's time, God will pour it out upon you. 
You see, it's not people think, well, I, I get the gift of the Holy Ghost, I just start speaking in tongues. It's not all about speaking in tongues. The Apostle Paul actually put it like this, I would rather you speak one word in English than a thousand words in tongues. And then he said, but I wish every one of you spoke in tongues. There's a time and there's a place for everything. And the gifts of the Holy Ghost is more than just speaking in tongues. It's more than Holy Ghost chill bumps. It, it's more than, than just going around and laying hands on somebody and watching them recover. Listen, the Holy Ghost Spirit of God is the what empowers you. It's what empowers you to live this life every single day. Hallelujah. When you get born again, God said, I'll put my spirit inside of you. You have the Holy Spirit, but when you get baptized with the Spirit, oh, glory to God. This is the difference right here. You can have the Holy Spirit, but you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't know how we're getting off on all this. But when you have the Holy Spirit, you're in control. But when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, He's in control of you. Does that make sense? It's just like being water baptized. Not sprinkled now because that don't work. I'm talking about when you get baptized, you don't get sprinkled. When you bury somebody, you don't put a little bit of dirt on them, do you? No, you want that body all the way down. Same way in water baptism. You want to go down and wash. Hallelujah. It's a symbol that you are dead and buried. Your old man is buried and you come up fresh. But the baptism and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 14. You can go 13 too, but that's the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 12, 14, and 15. You can find out all about what we're talking about right now. Read that. Study that out. And pray. When you read God's word, pray that God will begin to open up your life and your heart to receive the gifts that God wants you to have. We need a church that operates in the gifts of the Holy Ghost. The first church that God built, the first church that God built in Acts chapter 2, there was not a dead church. It was a church that was full of the Holy Ghost and power. Jesus, when John was baptizing, John said, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me who's mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not even worthy to on a latch. I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with power, with fire. With fire. Go ahead, brother. The Holy Ghost is a present help in time of need. He's a present help in the time of trouble. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. I'm talking about that is where we get our power from to live this life. It's where you get the power. Acts chapter 1, he said, you will be endued with power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come up on you. And you will be my witnesses in all of Judea, Samaria, and all throughout the world. Brother Mike, that's what it takes. If we're going to be a true witness, if we're going to have the courage to stand up, we got to have the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in our lives. We need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. James, he had it. You know what? He went all the way to the grave, but he had the gifts of the Holy Spirit. My goodness. We need to seek for We need to ask God, God, whatever you have, I want it. Whatever you have, God, I want it. I don't understand everything that God has for us, but I want it. If God said we can have it, here, pour it out, Lord. I don't care if I understand it. Lord, show me. Show me, Lord. And that's why a lot of people, they don't come for it because they don't understand. They're afraid of it. But I promise you, God is nothing to be afraid of. He will help you anytime, anyway. And if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously, liberally, and without reproach. And it will be given to him. Verse 6. But let him ask in faith Without what? Without wavering or without doubting. For he who wavers or doubts is like a wave in the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. So you can pray for something, but if you doubt, guess what? You ain't going to get it. You ain't going to get it. If you pray to God, you best believe that he's going to give you what you're praying for. You best believe that he's able to give you what you're praying for. 
because he didn't stop there, did he? He said, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. If we doubt God when we're praying, James said, you ain't going to get nothing from God. You know what? I wonder sometimes, son, if that's, we come up and we pray for sicknesses to be healed and we pray for things to happen and then we go back to our seats the same way we come up. And I wonder, Brother Bill, is it because we doubt? Is it because our faith isn't strong enough? Because God said if you have the faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you can say to that mountain out there, be thou plucked up and cast into the sea, and it will obey you. If we got the faith of a mustard seed, but if we doubt, we shall receive nothing. I mean, when I get up and go up there, you don't believe in what you're praying to. You know, That's you're it. To what you're praying to and why you're That's it. That's it. We must believe wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. And you know, God's will, uh, we talk about that. And people get that. Sometimes we let that get in our mind and we begin to think about that and overthink it. We do. We overthink it. Because we come up and we say, well, we want to pray for this person. I do it too. No, I'm not pointing fingers. I do this. So we want to pray for this person. And then we want to pray God's will be done. But if you read your Bible, God's word said, I, God's will is that you prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. So not only does God want your soul to prosper, but God wants you to prosper, your health to prosper. Oh, not man. only that, Chad, but you and I could pray all day and all night mm -hmm. for someone. For yes. A healing. Uh huh. If they come up, if they don't believe, they're gonna get that healing. They're not gonna get. They're not going, going to. Going That's right. That's we it. can pray from now on. That's they right. Still wouldn't get. That's right. Absolutely. They gotta have a made up mind. You get. have to believe. That's right. You have to have a made up mind, brother Bill. And I've always told everybody the night that we had when we got prayed for the kidney stones. You can ask my wife. How many did I have? Probably I'd pass like two a week, wouldn't I? And this was y'all like three years, Santa. It was a long time. I was passing them most time. It was at least once a week. Like Uncle Jack and Monk and all of them, I guess it's a beaver's thing, genetics, I don't know. Past When I worked at ABC Coat, they sent me over there to UAB to get tested. Of course, they told me I drunk too much Mountain Dew, I eat red meat, and I eat uh, dairy products. I said, well, I'm not gonna quit either. <laughs> you drink sweet tea? Yes, I do, that's all I drink. Well, you need to quit that. I ain't going to. I'm sorry, I got the beaver's hard head, I tell you, I guess. But anyways, it was all the time. One Wednesday night, we was going to church. I was dying. I had a kidney stone. It was killing me so bad. My head was in the floorboard of the car. My feet was over the back seat. I don't know, I was contorted some way because when you have those, you hurt so bad. You're trying to find a place that you can get out of pain. It was horrible. And I told her on the way to church, I said, I'm not waiting until prayer time. I'm going up there, and I'm going to pray God's going to give me my healing tonight. Mm -hmm. And church, I went in there. <coughs> Did we not? I said, I can't wait till prayer time after service. We need to pray right now. The church come up. They laid hands on me, begin to pray. And God healed me right then and right there. I believe wholeheartedly. Had a made-up mind. And I'm tell, I tell people this all the time. You have to have a made-up mind that you are not. You're not going to go back to the way you were. You're not going to take that sickness back with you. You are healed by the blood of Jesus. Okay. By his stripes, you were healed. Not that you are healed. You were healed. God's already paid for the healing, Brother Mike. I don't know how we're getting on this, but, but God's already paid for the healing. All you got to do is accept it and believe it. And claim it. I'm talking about take it to heart. Your God took those stripes for you. He was hung up for your hang-ups. He put the crown of thorns on for your headaches. He took the stripes across his stomach for your stomach problems. He took the stripes across his legs for your hip pain and your leg pain and your feet. Listen, he took it for you so that you don't have to deal with it. 
That's why he said on the cross, it is finished. It was no so much more than this salvation. It was salvation first, yes. And it was deliverance, freedom. You don't have to be bound to anything or any person or anything. You don't have to be bound. Who the Son sets free is truly free indeed. Amen. Deliverance, healing. You were healed. You are healed. Not you can be, you were. We've got to walk in that and believe wholeheartedly with a made up mind. He said right here, let him ask in faith without wavering, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man, verse 7, suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, verse 8, he is a double-minded man. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. My goodness. Now let me tell you what that means. It means that if you got faith enough to pray to God, you need to have faith enough to believe God. Because you can have faith, but if you have doubt, you're unstable. You're unstable. Or some people might not have faith. But I don't know. I don't know. But you've got to have a made up mind. You can't have faith in doubt. Or you can't have doubt and not have faith. Some people, not that they don't believe that they can get healed, but they'll go up and get prayer because they want healing, but they'll pick it back up and go back to their seat because they feel like they deserve the pain. I believe that's probably possible a lot of times. Yes, yes. And then there are some people that just don't really want to be healed. It's a crutch. Yeah. It's a crutch. Some people, they, they doubt. Some people pick it back up when they leave the altar. That's why Jesus told them to get rid of that crutch. Get rid of your crutch. Remember when that man, he had that mat, God told him, he said, get rid of that. Cast it down and come to me. Listen, that's what we've got to do. We've got to get rid of the crutch that we've been holding on to. I've had people tell me, that's right, they get sympathy, and people show them attention, man, government, government money, come on now, Boy, we, we're going to get fired tonight, <laughs> we're going to run out of here, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. I'm going to tell you, if you don't put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, there ain't nothing else in this world that is a firm foundation for you to stand on. Anything you put your trust in outside of God, it is sinking sand. Amen. That ought to be shot material right there. I don't know about y'all tonight, but I am thank God that I can put my trust in His Word and in Him. And I'll stand. Hallelujah. When the storms come, I'll stand, Brother Tim. I will not be moved. When a storm comes, we will not be moved. You're going to be just like that old palm tree that bows over when the wind comes, but when it's gone, it stands right back up again. But if you put your foundation and trust in anything other than God, you're going to be blowed away. You're like a, a wave. A wave. You know what a wave does? It gets tossed everywhere. Everywhere into everything. And you ever felt like that? Like your life is just being tossed every which way? Maybe it's because we're unstable. And we're going to get back on that firm foundation. Hey, Jeff. Hey. A lot of that, too, I believe, is about us wanting our healings and stuff. Uh -huh. But like, I believe to be fair. Okay. Yeah. Kind of, like in old days, they go up and pray to live with your old back. Uh -huh. Or LC, for example, uh -huh. when he was around. What would people have thought if he went to the church, come in, and walked out totally normal? Yeah. I know myself, I'd be sort of Scared. Oh, no, I wouldn't. I'd be I praising would. God and shouting hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Some people would be. Some people would be. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. And that, that's because they got their foundation all the way on God. You got to believe it. If you pray for it, you got to believe it. Yeah. You got to believe it. If not, you're on. You're unstable. You're like a, wind, a wave that's tossing about. 
You're wasting your time. There's no sense of even praying. That's right. Absolutely. But no, you're right. You're right. That's something that's like that. That's fear. Was you going to say something to me, brother? Uh, you're talking about the palm tree. Uh-huh. It's grounded. Yes. See, the roots on a palm tree, they go down in the ground just as high as the tree is tall. That's right. So it's grounded. It's grounded. That's it. And that's where we are. If our hope is in Jesus and we got our foundation in him, we are rooted and grounded. Thank the Lord. There ain't no storm going to blow you down. All right. And it says, verse 8, He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Now, this is all talking about faith. And on over the next chapter, it's going to get a little more clear, but we're fixing to jump. It's like I told you. James goes from one thing to another degree. So right here, it's fixing to go to something else. So bear with us just a moment. Verse number 9 says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. What does that mean right there? It means if somebody that's been poor all their life or somebody who hasn't had much, if they uh, get blessed and get wealthy or get healed or whatever it is, that they never had nothing and now they do, let them glory. Let them praise God for that. But there's another step to it. But the rich in his humiliation... Because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner than the sun has risen with a burning heat, than it withers the grass and the flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Right there, this is talking about uh, if somebody gets blessed, Brother Steve's never had anything that, that raises up, praise the Lord for it. But if a rich person, somebody who has everything in the world, and they lose something that they got, what does it say right here? But the rich in his humiliation, we need to not get sad and, and downbeat about it, but we need to praise God that he's still making it. Why? Because he goes on right here. For no sooner, or as the flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner than the sun has risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, the flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. This is talking about people that are laying up their treasures here on this earth. This earth has nothing to offer you. Amen. My goodness, I'm preaching some dead bones tonight. My goodness. Somebody got a horn in here? <laughs> yeah, we need that. We said that. We need one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This world has nothing to offer you. James is trying to show us something here. That people, you can put your trust in things, possessions. But what if a man gains this whole world and loses his soul? We're not laying up our treasures here, y'all. This, this as soon as the, as the sun comes up and the, the grass withers and the flower fades, this world is the same way. Just as fast as the sun comes up, Sister Joyce, just as soon, soon and fast as the sun comes up, this life is the same way. It's only for a moment, Brother Mike. Only for a moment. We are passing through this life and it's temporary. And we can try to be like the beautiful flower. But just like the sun comes up and it fades away, so our life is going to fade away. But if we're laying up our treasures in heaven, amen, we're not going to leave them behind. We're going to go to them. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And he goes on right here. Till the rich man also will fade away in his pursuit. Verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation. Now we're going back. Blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been proved he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I like that right there. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. What does the word endure mean? Can anybody tell me? Withstand. Outlast it. That's it. That's it. Withstand it. Outlast it. Keep going. He, he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. When it comes, you've got to stand strong. You've got to stand strong. God's word did not say, blessed is the man who never has temptation 
Or blessed is the man who can so easily conquer temptation. No, he said blessed is the man who endures it. That means who can take it and who can overcome it. Mm. We're going to all be tempted. That's right. And there's a reason for that temptation. You see, God does not tempt us, but sometimes God allows the enemy to tempt us to try our faith. And that's what he's saying here. Remember Job. Remember Job. Satan walking around in the earth looking for somebody to mess with. And what did God say? Well, I got a somebody for you. Have you thought about my servant Job? And the devil said, yeah, hey, I like that one. I want to get that one. And God allowed him to be tempted and to be tried, but it was for God's glory. And if Job is for a learning experience. Even his wife, when he that's right, absolutely right. But he said, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been proved. That's it. That's the word I'm talking, looking for right there. When we have been proved, God is using this to show us something. God is using this to show us that he is faithful even through our trials. He is faithful even through our temptations. And Sister Joyce, there's been times in my life when I was going through something that was so hard and I didn't understand it, but I look back now and I say, man, I wish I had that feeling that I had when I was going through that. Do y'all know what I'm talking about or is it just me? Because there's been times where I have fought and struggled and didn't know what I was going to do and didn't understand why I was going through something, but I felt like now I was so close to God through that, I was learning something in the process. It was producing endurance. It was producing patience. And you see, when you go through a trial, that's why we're to count it joy. It's because if you will hold on through it, don't, don't just suffer through it. Count it joy. Count it joy because it is doing something for you. You might not can see at the moment, but it is producing something that's going to help you in your future. What you're going through right now is producing fruit in you that's going to help you the next struggle we go through. That, that's true. That's true. Most of the time you're in constant contact with God. And sometimes that's why God has to put us through trials. Because, you know, what? hey, hello, did you forget my number? Did you forget where I am? Hello, I'm God still. I still want to hear from my child. And I'm going to have to put you on your knees. The only way to get you to talk to me. That's it. Did you say something, sis? It's not for you to learn. Maybe you can be there for somebody else when they go. True. That's right. That's right. And God will put us through things that way we can help somebody or with a testimony or with a praise report. You know, God brought us through it. He'll bring you through it. There's always a bigger picture. There's always a bigger picture. Right. That's it. But blessed is the man or woman. Let me say that. Blessed is the man or woman. And that's the only two genders they are, okay? Yeah. You're either a male or a female. Anybody watching my video? That's right. You're male or female. I don't care what Biden said. He don't. Never mind. He don't even know who his wife is. Thinks it's his sister. You're either a male or female. You're not what you say you are. You're what God made you. Amen. 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 Thank you, God. Blessed is the man or the woman who endures temptation. For when he has been proved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I want you to understand something. If you will just hold on in this life, honey, you, if you'll adhere through this time that you're going in right now, God said there's a crown of life on the other side that you are going to receive. And this world, it may be hard at times, but you'll never remember once you step out of this walk and in the glory land. This this will be the last thing on your mind. You'll receive a crown that's been laid up for you, but not up for you only, but to all those who love His appearing. Hallelujah. There's a crown on the other side with your name on it if you'll hold on. Amen. Hold on. And let, oh my goodness, let God, let God get you through this trial. Let God get you through and see you through. Don't lose faith in Him. He's going to see you through. 
Amen. Let me go ahead with 13 and 14 and we'll stop right there. He said, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. There's where we get the scripture. If you find in yourself in a temptation, that is not from God. God does not tempt you. God allows you to go through trials, but the devil is the one who sends temptations your way. But God said these words, I will not let you be tempted more than you can stand, but I will always make a way of escape that you will be able to endure it. I believe that wholeheartedly. There's times where I thank God, you got more faith in me than I believe I have in you. Because you think I can handle this, but I feel like I'm about ready to explode. Anybody ever been there before? God, you must have a lot of faith in us because I feel like I'm ready to give up. And God said, no, you ain't. I'm about to show up and show out. And that's when God will help you. When, that's right. That's right. And, and when he gives you the assurance that everything's going to be all right. You know, I'm ready to give up. But God said, we're just now getting started. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. And that word lust right there is desires, our own fleshly, sinful desires. God does not tempt anyone, but it is our own lust, our own desires. Listen, what does the Bible say that the things that, that gets us is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. <laughs> Listen, you don't hear that preached on very often, but that's what God said. Those things will get you in trouble. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know what? We're human. We're born into human or into this world, into this body, and we are full of sin. We're born into sin. And that's why Jesus had to come. Hallelujah. And once you get washed again, born again, washed by the blood, that sinful nature, God begins to regenerate you. He begins to wash that away, and you become like him. But if we're not careful, we can still be drawn back. We can be drawn. And that's what he said right here. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away. What does Hebrews say? Hebrews says we are not of those who draw back unto perdition. But we are of those to the saving of the soul. That means we're not going to back up. We're not going to turn around. But we're going to keep pressing forward. I wish that you would say that tonight with me. But we're not going to back up. We're not going to turn around, but we're going to keep pressing forward. Remind yourself that daily, church. It's so easy for the devil to throw something in front of you, a temptation, and our lust draw us away. So easy. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. What does enticed mean? It means huh? tempted. Makes it look good. Makes it look enticing. And what? That's it. And you're right. And what you just said right there, you're lured. You just said it. Fishermen in here, what do you do? You get that pretty worm, and you put that on a hook, and you throw that out there in that water in front of that crappie or that bass or whatever you're fishing, and you move that lure, you're enticing that fish. And that fish is drawn away until it gets a hold of it. And when it gets a hold of it, it brings to death. You're going to find it's hooked. That's right. It's hooked. And we're the same way. If we're not careful, our lust will draw us away and we'll get hooked. And sin brings death. We're going to read that next week. But has anybody got any questions, comments, or input you want to share tonight? You got something? No? No? <laughs> You learn anything? Oh, we learned about love and caring. Love and caring. Yeah. 